We know that in your presence that there is fullness of joy and pleasure at your right hand forevermore. We just thank you for how you graced us this morning. And Lord, we come before you and we open our, our hearts, we open our spirits to you. We want to heed what you were saying to us, Lord. We want to hear and we want to heed what you are saying. Lord God, we thank you for this hour that you have called us for such a time as this. Yes. Oh God, yes, you yes. have called us to be those yes. Esthers for this season that we are in. Yes, amen. And God, amen. I cry out for a right a mighty strength of your power to be upon your people, Lord God. We want to become that force to be reckoned with. Oh God, we ask that you that you prepare us to be this vessel. Oh God, we thank you that you are preparing us. Lord God, we thank you that you are doing a deep inward work. Oh God, we say we want you to do, we want you who started it to bring it to completion in your timing. Oh God, we pray that we will arise, that we will not fall, fall away, but we will arise and be strong in you in the power of your might. Oh God, because the days are evil, oh God, but that we would be those that are focused, that our vision and our, our eyesight will be upon the man, Christ Jesus. We will follow the Lamb wherever he goes and not another voice, O oh God, we ask. And Lord, I thank you for the word, O oh God, that you have given Ken. And Father, I cry out that, that you just strengthen him. And I pray for that. We thank you for the open heaven. And we ask for your words. We thank you that your words are spirit and they are life, O oh God. And we just pray for the flow of your spirit that he would have the tongue of a ready writer oh God and your words would flow today and God it would bring life to all who hear we pray in Jesus name that you be glorified in Jesus name yes amen amen all right this is um, session 10 in our uh, forerunner school class um, called a theology of the bride and you know some of you look at like session 10 where do some of the other sessions go and uh we're actually doing nine and ten here and then i'm going to do some of the intermediate ones more uh just to put online uh but uh anyway this is session 10 of the theology of the bride and what we're doing is we're looking last session and this session we're looking at the book of esther uh, as a type and shadow of the preparation and the partners, the purpose, the preparation and the partnership that the bride, the end time bride, will have with Christ. And this, uh, these two sessions are really important. Um, I love types and shadows. I don't know. I don't know. Do you like the, the study types and shadows? I don't know if anybody else likes them, but I love those because you know you, what what they do. You can. You can see like one verse of scripture, or one, two or three verses of scripture in the New Testament that produce a, a powerful principle. Uh, and then you see just a, a whole book or a, a, a passage in the Old Testament that in type and shadow form explains that one verse. And you see such a panoramic view of what the Lord really meant uh, in, in that one verse when you look at the type and shadow. So I love types and shadows. And, and Esther, the book of Esther, is, is, a, is a clear type of sh and shadow of how God wants to use the end time bride. Uh, in, and it's in, this, it's in our day. The, the preparation, which we looked at last time, uh, and also the partnership. Uh, he wants to use the end time bride as his partners. Uh, you know, we said this, we've said this for years and years, but now, boy, the rubber is meeting the road in terms of what's going on in the world. Uh, we said this for years that God has not called us to be merely spectators in end time events, but he's called us to be participators. Now, we've said that since the 90s for sure. But now things are happening in the world and he needs his bridal partners. He needs his bridal partners. Uh, and it's up to the, the church. I'm not just speaking to us individually here. I, I'm talking to 
uh, all those who will be watching this online and to the global church even, uh, that he, is, he really is desiring to raise up a partner, the bride, to partner with him in the end times uh, in the, in, against the issues, the Antichrist system and the issues that are rising up in this hour. And so anyway, we're going to look at that uh, today. Uh, I want to start out, though, by looking at a little bit of uh, review uh, from the book of Esther. I'm, I'm, basically what I'm planning to do today is just walk through the whole book. But uh, don't, get a, don't get frightened. It won't, I'm not going to go through every verse. It's only 10 chapters, but I'm not going to go through every verse. But I am going to kind of walk through the themes of each one because it, there's such, it's so timely right now with what's going on in the world. And I really want you to see what's happening in the context of scripture, but also more than that is to, to really see the call, the, the call that the Lord's putting on us as, a, as, a, as the church, global church, to rise up in this hour and to partner with him in the issues that are coming in the earth. That, that's the, the, the goal of this message. But anyway, let's start off with a little review. You know, in chapter one, we, you know, we see really the eternal purpose uh, of the bride, that even before the foundation of the world, you'll have to go back to the last session to get a lot of the detail on it, but even before the foundation of the world, uh, that the, the, the Lord called for a bride to be presented at the church age, at the end of the church age, that would be like Vashti, uh, beautiful and glorious, that at the end, at the, uh, end of the seven-day banquet, the end of the church age, to have that. That's his goal, to present to angels and demons and principalities and all the people of the world this beautiful, beautiful bride that he has created, that he has raised up in the midst of all the opposition and all the things that have come against it to show the world that he is able and is able to raise up this glorious, wonderful bride. That's the purpose of that. Uh, and uh, to raise up this bride who will not only be that beautiful example of Christ in the earth, but that beautiful bride who will be his partner, even in the end times, when he comes, and forever, to show that purpose in the, in the, book, of the, the book of Esther shows that. And so we talked about that last week or last time. Then we looked at the preparation of the bride. Remember, the bride had to go through 12 months of, uh, of uh, preparation before she would go in to the king. And, you know, I said this last time, and I'll say it again. We have to take the book of Esther out of the natural realm and bring it into the spiritual. Because if you look at it at the natural, uh, you know, it's, it's not a, necessarily a, a pretty picture. But you look at it in the spiritual, and it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture uh, of what God uh, is doing. And so all the young ladies that were brought into the, to the palace, they had to go through 12 months of preparation. They had to go six months of oil of myrrh treatments and then six months of uh, spices and cosmetics. And we talked about the meaning of that last time, and I won't talk about that again. But then each, each young lady would go into the king, uh, and, uh, and Esther was the one who was chosen, who pleased the king, and she was fully cooperating with the Holy Spirit and with the eunuchs, the, the forerunners. She fully cooperated with them. And so she was chosen uh, as the queen to be the, to be the bride. And so there's some beautiful uh, pictures and points that we learn from that in terms of our call to prepare ourselves. There is a, there is a real call upon the betrothed bride to make herself ready uh, for our king. Uh, and so we see some of the details of that. Now, I want to deal with one issue because I think this may be appropriate. The Lord, I've really put this on my heart to, to kind of spend a little bit more time on this. What would happen, the, the, the young ladies would, would go through the 12 months of preparation. They would go in to the, to, for their night with the king. And then after that, they would go to Shag, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing this right, Shagaz's harem. Shagaz's harem. Uh, and so... When they were in Shagaz's harem, uh, it had to be a very difficult time for the young ladies. Uh, 
Because if they were not called by name to go into the king's presence again, they would never again go into the king's presence. And so it, was, it became, uh, this is just my imagination, but it became a time of just waiting, testing. Was it, you know, did I, what did I do wrong? Look at the issues in my life. You know, evaluation. And so I think there's some of us you know, some of us have been on this journey of, I want to make myself ready as a bride for years. It's, it's new to some of us, but some of us have been saying, Lord, I want, you know, I want to be made ready as your bride. And we've done everything. We, we've gone through every oil of myrrh treatment we knew to go through. We've, we've got every spice that we knew and rubbed ourselves with it. We put on all these fragrances. We've tried to please the Holy Spirit. We've tried to do everything the forerunners said that we needed to do. And now we're in Shagaz's harem and we're waiting and we're thinking, oh, is it enough? Oh, I look at my flesh and I say, yuck. I see sin. I see self. I see all these things. When we come to the judgment seat of Christ, will he summon me into his chambers as his bride? That's the question. And I think there's some of us, I know I'm, I feel that way a lot, and I think there may be some others that feel that way. And I think in those seasons, we've just got to trust. Here's what I felt like the Lord said. We, we've got to just trust that, we, that, the, the, that our Mordecai, the Holy Spirit, and our obedience and our cooperation with him, whatever he brings up, will lead us to be selected as part of his bridal company, his eternal bridal company. We've got to trust. It's a time of testing for sure. But we've also got to pray. Now, I'm sure those young ladies in, that, in Shagaz's harem, I'm sure that what they were doing, they were crying out. Uh, th those that, that had a relationship, they were crying out and said, I want to be part of, I want to be the bride. I want to be, they cried out for that. And we have to do that. We have, it's really important that we do that. You know, we're, while we're waiting, we've done everything that we know to do, and while we're waiting, he said, Lord, whatever, whatever it takes, whatever I need to do that I have not yet done. Now, I know it's by grace and it's by work of the Holy Spirit, but whatever needs to take place, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to do it in my life. Whatever the cost Whatever the price, whatever oil or myrrh or cosmetic or whatever I need to put to submit myself to, I say yes to it because I want to be made ready. Shagaz's harem is a, is a place that all of us need to really consider. It's that time of waiting. Will I be, a, will I be selected? And will you cry out and say, God, I want to be the eternal wife of of the Lamb. I want to be that. Make me ready. Make me ready to do that. Amen? Amen. I hope you'll, I hope you'll heed that. That's an important, an important point. Okay. All right, but that's not actually the message for today. The message for today is we're going to talk about, because we talked about preparation last time. This time we're going to talk about partnership. Esther and the bride in partnership with the king. We want to talk about it in three dimensions, mainly before he comes. That's the first dimension. Partnering with Christ before he returns at his second coming. Partnering with Christ as he comes in his triumphal entry. And then third one is partnering with Christ forever as his bride. 
Uh, and we want to talk mainly about, uh, we'll, we'll spend more time on the first one. So if we spend a lot of time on it, we won't have to, we won't spend a lot of time on the second and the third one. But, okay, let's look at the partnership. Let's look at the context of, of how God is raising up the bride in the end times. I hope if you have your Bibles or on your phone, I really encourage you to, to kind of read along with me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to touch on just a few of the key verses. Like I said last time, really the book of Esther is a powerful book and you need to read it and study it for yourself to really get it. But here's what happens. After, this is after the bride has made herself ready. Uh, after these events, King, this is chapter 3, verse 1. After these events, King Assyrius promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. Now hear that? I do what you hear that the Agagite, and advanced him and established his authority over all the princes he were, who were with, with him. So God raised up, or the king in this case, raised up Haman. He raised up Haman, the Agagite. Now Haman is a picture of the Antichrist and the Antichrist system. Uh, it, he was an Agagite. An Agagite was from the line of the Amalekites, which go back to Exodus 17, where uh, Moses had to have his hands raised in the battle that went on with the Amalekites, and, and where God revealed himself as the, the Lord our banner, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Uh, but it says in that, in, in Exodus, that there will be a, a fight, a, a war between the Amalekites and the people of God through every generation. And so we see that Haman was part of that, and as, as such, he was part of the uh, Antichrist system. Uh, so uh, he w was was that. He was that. Uh, he was th that part of the Antichrist. Also, we see that he had a plan to destroy the Jews in this case, but in, in as we take it into our day, the Jews and the Christians. The Antichrist system wants to destroy us. Let's don't, let's don't minimize that point. But if you look at chapter 3, and we're not going to look at all the verses, it's really interesting. Uh, what happened was that everybody would bow down to Haman, except Mordecai. Now, Mordecai is a picture of the Holy Spirit. Remember, we talked about that. It's a picture of the people of God. And so, Haman gets really angry, and Haman says, okay, what I want to do is I want to destroy Mordecai, but not only Mordecai, I want to destroy all of his people, which would be the Jews, and, and again, taking it to the New Testament would be all of us. Again, we're showing that he's part of the, he's a picture of the Antichrist system. And so it's interesting. He comes up with a plan, a plan to destroy him, and they, they make the plan in the first month of the year but they cast lots and they come up and decide that we're, we're going to implement the plan at the halfway through the 12th month of the year. That's an interesting point, isn't it? They come up with a plan. You can see it right in, in Esther chapter 3. They come up with this plan to, to, in the first month, but it's not going to be implemented until the 12th month, the end times. We see they have a heart to destroy all the people. So we see that this is a, the, the Antichrist system. It's a picture of the Antichrist system. And so we see here what, what happens, that Haman demands allegiance from all the people. And Haman, everybody bowed down to him other than Haman, I mean, other than Mordecai. And Mordecai, again, is a picture of the Holy Spirit within a people. So in other words, all but the people of God bowed down uh, to Haman. And they first, they tried, chapter 3, verse 4, they tried speaking to him daily, but he would not listen. And so when they tried to convince him to bow down, he wouldn't listen to it. But then that's when he came up with his plan. And, and so look at verse 10 of chapter 3. Then it says that the king took off his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman. 
uh, and then verse 11, and he said, the king said to Haman, the silver is yours and the people also to do with them as you please. Now, this is an interesting point because I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm going to make the application here in just a minute. But the king gave authority to Haman. His signet ring means that he had the authority of the king. In other words, he was given authority over the silver, the money. He was given authority over the people to do with them as whatever he wanted to do with them. And to, his goal in doing that was to come against uh, the religious issues, the, the people of God, the Jews at that point in time. Now that's, that's exactly, that's exactly what's happening today. We, we, you know, I, I taught this probably 20 years ago when we first started teaching on Esther. And I was teaching on all this, but it was like, you know, I knew it was true, but it was like none of it, very little of it had it really actually happened. But right now, we're living right in the middle of it. You know, I kind of, in a way, hesitate to use too many examples because things that were like shocking three or four years ago are like nothing right now. You know, because it's gotten so, it's getting so much worse. That's antichrist system is getting worse and worse and worse. And it's affecting the money and it's affecting the people. I mean, who, this may be a nothing down the road, I don't know, but right now there's a convention or coming uh, a, a meeting of the World Health Organization where the United States is talking about surrendering its sovereignty uh, in the issue of pandemics to a global agency that is certainly not pro-America. So they would have complete control if a pandemic comes. You know, Australia, Shanghai, you know. So th this system is, is rising up and the, there is a diabolical plan behind it. Make no mistake about it, there is a diabolical plan behind it. So many issues that are being raised up. And then verse 15 of chapter 3, they sent out a decree that this is going to be happening to destroy all the Jews. And the city of Susa was in confusion. Last, that's verse of chapter 3. The city was in confusion. Now that's what's happening. That's what's happening right now. We're, we're you know, it, it hasn't turned into just major riots and things like that. But there's confusion, and you know, like where is this going? How can this, how can this be? I know this is a heavy message, but it's where we are. It's where we are. Now let's go to chapter 4 because God's got, God's got a solution and that solution is you. And then verse, chapter 4 verse 1, when Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and wailed loudly and bitterly. So other, again, Mordecai is the Holy Spirit. Again, picture this inside you. The Holy Spirit is wailing and mourning over what's going on in the world. But then look at Esther. Verse 4. Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her and the queen, she wreathed in great anguish. But not the anguish that Mordecai had. And she sent garments to clothe Mordecai that he might remove his sackcloth from him, but he did not accept them. 
And so Esther, remember Esther's the, the bride in preparation. Esther says to Mordecai, take away that burden. Don't, don't, don't wail like that. Put on your festive garments. Take off all that. Well, it's, not, it's, it's no reason to be burdened. There's no reason to be in anguish over the circumstances. And I really think, you know, I mean, you, you know this as well as I do, that much of the church, that's the attitude of much of the church right now. All this is happening, and it's just getting, I mean, you know, when you think it can't get any worse, and some, you know, next week something else happens, it's like, how in the world? Did that, is that starting? It, and, but much of the church is like, oh, just, let's just keep on living like we did 20, 30 years ago. But we can't live that way anymore. We can't. And God wants the church to wake up. Amen. And so as forerunners, you know, we've got to be part of the message to wake them up. Uh, that's part of our call is to do that. We can't be angry with those who have not awakened, but we have to. We have to. We have to be a voice. We ha as well as we have to participate ourselves in the partnership. And so, let's let's move on. So Esther tried to 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 put on the garments on Mordecai. Then Esther. This is verse five. Then Esther summoned. Hachak from the king's eunuchs whom the king had appointed to attend to her and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. To learn why, what was happening and why. Um, now, that is an important point for those of us that like to just not pay attention to what's going on in the world. Esther, we'll see in a minute, Esther woke up. But how did she wake up? She, she felt, okay, something's going on, but she didn't really understand it. And so she sent people to Mordecai, to the Holy Spirit, to find out, okay, what is really happening? And so, you know, I know we don't need to be into so much into the world that we miss God. But we need, a, the church needs an understanding of what is happening in the world. We need to understand what's going on. Why? So that we can be a partner with God to really stand against it. So Esther did that, and she got understanding. She, and, she, and she got understanding, and as she got understanding, then she woke up. And she realized that she was born for such a time as this. She realized, I have to go in. She, she was placed in a position of authority, of responsibility, where she knew of all the people in the kingdom, she was the one. She was the one that had the privilege and the position and the ability to go into the king and ask for him to reverse the plan. The plan was to destroy Mordecai and to destroy all the Jews. That was the, Haman's plan. That's the plan. Believe me, that is the plan of the Antichrist system in, this, in our day, is to destroy the people of God, both Jews and Christians. That is their plan. Who has the, who has the privilege to go in, to intercede before the king, to stand in the gap for all this. The bride who has made herself ready. The bride who's, who has understanding. And the bride who knows what's going on. And so th that's, the, that's the call upon the Esther. And that's the call upon the bride in, in the context of partnering 
with God. It's a lot more what God wants to do with the bride in the end times is a lot more than just what's re revealed in chapters 1 and 2 to prepare the bride so that she'll be a glorious vessel to present to Christ. That's a major part of it, obviously, and definitely. But God wants the bride to partner with him in these end time events. He, he is calling us to be his partners. And so Esther comes up with a couple of phrases that we use a lot. Chapter 4, verse 14. And who knows that you, who knows whether you have not, if you have not attained royalty for such a time as this? Who knows that you have not attained royalty? In other words, you have not been prepared as a bride for Christ for such a time as this. Now, that's, that's an attitude that the bride has to have. We need to understand what's going on. We under, need to understand that we, that the only one who can really intercede is the church. And the church, who, especially the church who's making herself ready as a bride. And so there's a need for us to understand this, that we have been called as a bride and for such a time as this. Let's not be mistaken. We are not on the earth right now by accident. We are here as ordained of God. And so he has equipped us with the ability to do exactly what Esther did. Or he wouldn't, he wouldn't have said that. We have attained royalty for such a time as this. And believe me, we're in such a time. We are in such a time and, and I, I, I fear that if the church doesn't wake up, who knows what will happen. I do definitely believe that our nation, America, stands in the balance and the intercession and ministry of the bride in America will make a huge difference whether we become a sheep or a goat nation. The government system is on a path, direct path right now, to control. They have the, author the governmental authority, they have control of the money, and they have control of the people or they're trying to get control of the people. And it's the, the, the ultimate goal of the enemy, maybe not the, the, the government themselves, but the, of the enemy is to destroy the people of God. So there's a battle looming. In fact, no, it's not even looming, it's here. We have to stand in the gap. We have to stand. And so what did, what did Esther do? She had this attitude, verse 16. Okay, I'm going in. If the king doesn't accept me, I can die. But I have this attitude. If I perish, I perish. You know, I don't want to die. But if I perish, I perish. And we need that, we need that attitude. We need first to submit our life to Christ. To Christ. You know, he says you have to take up your cross. You have to die daily. You have to do all these things. And so we say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to submit my life to, the, to engage in this battle. It's more than just preparation. That's a big part of it, a huge part of it. But, but I'm going to submit to this battle. I'm going to be a part of it. And if I perish, I perish. I'm submitting my life to Christ first. Now, it, obviously, every person when they come to Christ submits to him. But it's more, it's more than that. It's more than that. That's part of it, obviously, a big part of it. But we must submit to him in the midst of what's going on in the world. That, Lord, I'll use me however you want me to use me. Whatever, whatever, you want me, whatever you want me to be, whatever you want me to do, I submit to you. It's that kind of an attitude. I know that this thing is raging all over the world. 
I submit to you, Lord. Yeah. That's the attitude we all need. But we also have to submit to the battle. There's a battle. It's in the spirit realm right now, and I don't know if it'll stay in the spirit realm or if it'll come to the natural realm. I'm not sure what all will happen with it. Probably will, it will come to the natural eventually. But we have to submit. If, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to submit to you, Lord, and I am going to submit to the battle, whatever you want me to do and be. That's the attitude that Esther had. And so, you know, we, we, see, we see that God accepted her and used her. Let, let's, uh, let's go on to chapter 5. Now, it came, I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Now, it came about on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's rooms, and the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. So she put on her royal robe. So she put on her bridal, you know, she was dressed in her bridal garments, the bride made ready, the bride on a journey of making herself ready. Uh, and she uh, also stood with confidence because she had, she had been on the preparation process and had pleased the king in the secret place and had been selected in, in, in that role. And so she had confidence to come, even though she knew the consequences, what they could be, she had confidence because she had been on that journey of preparation. In chapter, verse two, I mean, chapter five, verse two. And it happened when the king saw her uh, standing in the court, Bible up here. So she obtained favor in his sight, and the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. Uh, so Esther came near and touched the scepter. And then in verse three, the king said to her, "What is troubling you, Queen Esther? And what is your request? Even to half the kingdom, it will be given to you." Up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. So we learn a lot from that. She came into the king's presence, confidence because of her preparation process and because she was clothed uh, in, in her bridal uh, garments. And so she goes in and she gets the scepter of authority. In other words, it's a, it's a scepter of, uh, of favor and it's a scepter of authority. Uh, that I, I'll give to you favor to discuss your issue and ultimately we see that he gave her authority. And then he says to you this, even half, even to half of the kingdom it will be given to you. Now what does that speak about? Half the kingdom. Partnership. He said, we'll, we'll be partners in this, in this issue. So don't mistake this point. God wants his church to be partners with him, not only in the preparation process, obviously in that, but also in the partnership to enter and engage in this battle that looms over the earth. We've got to be partners with him, up to half the kingdom. I'll partner with you on this. But you look at how Esther came. He says, what is troubling you, Queen Esther? What is troubling you? In other words, she, even though she had on her royal garments and she had confidence to enter, she came in with a burden. She came in burdened for her people. And so we have to allow the Holy Spirit to burden us for all that's going on. You know, it, it, it burdens me to see what's happening. And I know it burdens a lot of us. But we've got to allow that burden to filter in to our coming before the king to intercede for the issues. Really, really important that we allow that burden of the Lord. So that Jesus says, Ken, what's troubling you? Yeah. 
really, really important. So anyway, she came with that. And then what we see is that, you know, we see it in chapters uh, 6 and 7. We, we see that, I'm trying to figure out exactly how much of this to go through. Um, where she, she interceded, let me, let me just read a, another verse here. This is in 7, uh, chapter 2. And what, what is your request? Even to half the kingdom it will be done. And then the Esther said, If I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given, uh, given me as my petition and my people as my request. For we have been sold and, I, and destroyed to be killed and to be annihilated. If we'd only been sold as slaves, men and women, I would, not have, rema I would have remained silent. For the trouble would not be commensurate with the annoyance of the king. So anyway, she asked, she asked for the deliverance of her people. And when she asked for the deliverance of the people, the king asked all that was there and what it was. And of course, Haman's plan is, re is revealed. And the tables are turned. Even though it's a little bit out of context, we see, we see, we see what happened in chapter 6. Because Haman wanted to be honored by the king. And so the king says, what should we do with somebody who we really want to honor? What should we do to really honor them? And Haman said, because th Haman thought, okay, this is going to be me. It's going to get honored here. So let's just make a parade and I'll ride on a horse through the town, and that person will ride on the horse through the town and be celebrated by all the people. And so the king said, yeah, that's a good idea. He said, get it ready for Mordecai. <laughs> he reversed the, turn, the table. He turned the tables on Haman. <laughs> now, that's what God's going to do. Haman's got this plan, and we know the outcome, that Jesus is going to turn the tables upside down and what is intended to be destruction for the people of God will actually be the destruction of the Antichrist system and all of the kings of the earth and all of those who are part of that system. And so we say, like we sang uh, today, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. You know, we want to see that uh, take place. Uh, so anyway, that's the before he comes partner. We go into the king, we, enter, we, we go before Jesus, we cry out for the deliverance of our people and all the various issues that are associated with it where that's part of the plan to take the silver, the people, and the religion. Remember going back to chapter 3. That's exactly where they're trying to control. They're trying to control the money they're, because if they control the money, then it's going to be very difficult to live if, if we have to submit to the Antichrist system because that's the only way we can have money. When they control the people, and, you know, we've, see, we've seen little pockets of it. I mean, you sure, I'm sure you've seen videos of what took place in Shanghai where they had people locked up, where they couldn't get out. You saw what happened in Australia during the pandemic. Don't think that can't come here. So that's how we partner with him. We intercede. We become a messenger to give information, to inform people. We, we, we become a builder, master builder in the spirit to build uh, things. We become forerunners that way. Now partner with him when he comes. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we, we dealt with this a lot in, when we looked at the three messages on the book of Revelation, the bride in the book of Revelation. We looked at Revelation 19, 11 through 21 at the second coming and how the Lord with his armies are going to destroy uh, the Antichrist, the, the, the beast and the, and the false prophet and the, uh, and the kings of the earth, how there's going to be a destruction 
of all that. And so we see this in, in Esther, uh, starting with about uh, chapter 7, verse 5 or so. And so we see that, you know, Esther kind of turned the tables on Haman. And we see in verse 8, when the king returned from the palace garden into the place where Haman and Esther were. It's almost like the second coming. What happens then? We see that uh, Haman is, is hung. Uh, his ten sons are, are, are hung. You know, if you look at chapter uh, 8 and, uh, and 9, let's, let's look at starting with verse 11 of chapter 8. The king granted the Jews who were in each and every city the right to assemble and to defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate the entire army of any people or province which might attack them, including children and women, and the plunder and their spoil. Uh, so, you know, we see, we, basically what we see there is after that, the tables are turned and the people of God are, are champions. They're victorious in, in, in accordance with the king and they, de they defeat the enemy. They defeat the enemy and they can't be, de they can't be defeated. And that's what's going to happen. We looked at it in detail back a few sessions ago when we looked at the, the bride and book of Revelation. The armies of God are, are with Christ when he returns. The angels and the bride made ready is with him. And that we march through the land and we, we destroy in partnership with Christ the, the enemy and all of the plans of the enemy. Uh, it's in Revelation and it's here as well. So we partner with Christ before he comes, which we talked about mostly, when he comes. And then we partner with him after he comes. We see that a little bit in chapter 10. Honestly, it's not quite as clear in terms of after he comes, but other places are clear. That the bride made ready is intended to partner with God now and forever. You know, uh, Isaiah 9-7, uh, nine, seven, nine, seven, I think it is. Uh, there'll be no end to the increase of his government. And we'll be in partnership with it. That's the eternal plan. Throughout all of the ages, the prepared bride will be the eternal partner of Christ. As the gospel, as the eternal gospel is spread throughout the creation in fullness, whatever that means. Certainly we got a thousand years of changing the earth and then the eternal ages from there. We're called. That's our call. But we need to start now. Uh, you know, I don't know if what will happen if we don't partner with God now, whether we'll be allowed to partner with him forever or not. I don't know. But I, I know we're invited now. Now, I want to I wanna give close with this. Our invitation for today this is for us who are here. It's for those who, those who are watching online. It's for the Forerunner School students, the pastors in Africa that, we'll, that we're equipping. This is our invitation. You have been born. You're here for such a time as this. You're here for such a time as this. That's the invitation today, to recognize that you are here for such a time as this. We must realize that we're not alive at this point in history by accident. We're not in this church by accident or we're not in the forerunner school by accident. We're not pursuing bridal preparation just to be ready, but also to partner with God in end time events and throughout eternity. We are, we are here for such a time as this. Secondly, we must develop an attitude of if I perish, I perish. We have, you know, the, we talked about this in Revelation 12. We have to lay down our soul life, our self life, to the point of 
love our life not even to death. We have to live that way. I'm here for, for Christ. I'm here for him. And, you know, if I perish doing that, I perish. I mean, you know, I mean, raise your hand if you want to be a martyr. Uh, and nobody does. I don't, I don't think. Uh, Bill Furler told me one time that this friend of his wanted to be a martyr, but uh, Bill, we went on a mission trip with him and he said, I'm not going again because he wants to be a martyr. And he was like <laughs> doing all this stuff. And so I don't want to be a martyr, but if I, but I want to, if I perish, if I perish, I perish. I want to live that way. I want to live that way that I'm, that I'll follow God. I'll follow the leading of God regardless of where, where it leads and what it costs. That's the way I want to live. And I think that's our invitation, to decide now that this is the way I want to live. Uh, third one, we must wake up to the urgency of the hour. We all would like to put festive garments on Mordecai, but the Holy Spirit is burdened for what's going on in the world. And we cannot delay. We cannot. We must, we must wake up to the urgency of the hour. And along those lines, we must, for, number four, we must get informed of what is going on. We really need to get informed. You know, and it, being informed doesn't need to surpass being made ready. But in the context of that, that we have to be informed of what's going on. Number five, we must realize we are called to partner with Christ for the kingdom and his people, the half the kingdom mentality. We are called to partner. And number six, we must come with the burden that the Lord is carrying before him. And we must join in the battle. Number seven, we must join in the battle for it is raging now. We must join in that battle. I know this is kind of a sobering word. It's beautiful when you see it in type and shadow form in the book, but when you realize what the cost of it is in our own life, it is a sobering word. But I've never been more sure that it's a true word. Word of the Lord. For us who are here, for those that are watching online, and for those that throughout the earth that we're, God has graced us with the opportunity to touch their lives. Uh, now is the time. We can't delay any longer. I really believe, this is a word for the American church, I really do believe that America has a real chance to be a sheep nation and not a goat nation. We have a chance to stand against this uh, and to be used, really, to, to maybe help the world. I, it's not, it hasn't been decided, I don't think, either way. You know, I think certain nations are not individuals, but the nations, the governments of the nations themselves maybe don't have as much opportunity. But I really believe America has a chance to be a sheep nation. But we, but it will not, now listen to me now, it will not happen unless we partner with God to stand in what I've talked about. It, it, you know, we can't just rock along and, be, and we'll be a sheep nation. If we rock, if the church, and I, when, I, when I say we, I'm talking beyond just the room here. We, if we just rock alone, we'll be sucked right in to this antichrist system that is being raised up right now. So we have to we have to stand. We have to stand. We have to participate. It's a call to all of us. Um, it's our invitation because God wants a bride made ready to present in all of its glory, but he also wants a bride in partnership to partner with him 
throughout the ages, starting now. Let's do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Lord, let's just stand up and let, let me have a prayer. And Father, I say yes to the invitation. Yes. And if you, want to, if you say you want to say yes, say yes. Just say it. Voice, voice it out loud, as loud as you feel. You can say it if you want to. I say yes, Lord. I say yes to it. Lord, I want to be your partner. I want to be your bride made ready. I cry out, God, for the anointing and opportunity to be those, oh God, I pray. Make us ready. Help us to partner with you by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, amen. You may just uh, oh, let's uh, we'll end the uh, online uh, teaching at this point. All right, We're, we've ended. Yeah, um, I, I just want to say I, I think I've heard Dad speak on the Book of Esther 116 times. That was my 117th time, and that was the best time he's ever done. I thought that was incredible. Um, laying out exactly the call the church has to stand in the gap and intercede. And we really, really, it's important that we wake up to the times we live in. Um, even like what he mentioned, uh, the, the WHO, the World Health Organization, trying to take sovereignty. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. I, I bet not many people have heard. Okay, well, more than I thought. In case you have not heard of that, the you know just like Dad said that there that, that if if the church does not rise up, we are going to give our sovereignty over to the World Health Organization. I mean it's just we're really living in critical times, and so the church needs to pray. And with that in mind, we do have prayer this Wednesday night at 6 p.m. and Thursday night at 6 p.m. I want to encourage everybody to attend. We really need to stand in the gap. We're going to be praying against abortion. We're going to be praying for the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Um, the, this, with the World Health Organization, we're going to be praying into because what could theoretically happen if we give control of our of our entire health uh, system over to this world international community? What could happen here? is the Supreme Court could overturn Roe versus Wade, bring it down to the state level, but then now the WHO has control of our, of our health and they could say no abortions are coming down internationally into your country and we've surrendered over sovereignty, see? So this is a huge deal, a really, really big deal. We need, like I, I think what dad said was so important, so much of the church is like looking at, at looking at Mordecai going, put on some better garments. You're being a little bit too sober. You're being a little bit too serious. You know, lighten up a little bit. We need to get on with our, our life as normal. And the Lord's like, no, that's not the heart of God right now. There is a call for intercession, for standing in the gap. And, you know, it's like, like it, like it talked about in Esther, is like, if you remain silent now, you know, that, that was the, the, the charge to Esther. Don't remain silent now. We've, we can't be prayerless at this time. We can't be prayerless. Leonard Ravenhill said that if you want to know how popular